Adam, you're driving slides, right? That's right. Trying to remember what all the icons are here for getting the slide started. Second from the left, Adam will get you the repo from the data tracker. The second from the left for me is gallery view. Uh, underneath your name in the upper left hand corner. Ah, fair. Thank you very much. So yeah, it's my first time sharing with Meet Echo, and I'm not sure exactly what I'm supposed to be seeing. The uh, icon is lit up, but I'm not actually seeing any slides myself. And um, we can see the slides. So huh. I think you're good to go. If you want to turn on video, you can. Adam, you probably need to click on the interview and the talk. Yeah, the, the icon on the, on the left on the upper right, Steph. Ah, oh, thank you. There's the problem. OK, just a little bit of a learning curve here. All right, so we're a couple minutes past the top of the hour here, so I think it's time to go ahead and get started. Um, you're in the priv boff, which should come as no surprise. Uh, right there, oh, there we go. So we're going to start off um, with the traditional note well. Um, if this is a surprise to you, it shouldn't be. This is basically saying if you know of any uh, patent rights associated with anything that you discuss, um, there are obligations uh, that are described in uh, BCP 79. Uh, please go read it and also behave yourself. That's basically the, the general gist here. So we have uh, Peter St. Andre has volunteered to take notes. Initially, he was going to take it for half of the session, but he just very kindly stepped up for the entire session, so we're good there. Um, traditionally, we have a Jabber scribe for those folks who are not on audio but want to ask questions. Do we have someone who can just monitor the chat in case there's someone who, for whatever technical reason, can't speak, uh, needs to have a question taken to the microphone? OK, I think I see Chris Agreed. saying yes. Agreed. Thank you Thank very you, much. Jonathan. All right, so overall agenda. We have, um, we're gonna start out with uh, 25 minutes from Ecker talking about uh, PPM and how it's different from what we've done before. We're going to go through use cases from a handful of folks um, and then talk about how this relates to some work going on in the CFRG research group. Uh, after that, we're going to have a bit more discussion uh, around the charter and expressions of interest. Does anyone want to suggest changes to the agenda we have here? All right, hearing no objection. Um, just a few notes on this. This is a working group forming BOF. The goal is to make sure that everyone understands what the problem is that we're trying to solve. Um, and we're going to talk about uh potential solutions here but we're not going to try to like improve those solutions or anything along those lines we'll be taking questions for clarification after the first presentation that explains the problem uh, and then we're going to have four presentations on associated use cases um, we're going to ask that the questions on the use cases are held until after the four speakers are done because they're fairly short slots and we want to get through them quickly and those are going to be for clarification and then we're going to talk about as i mentioned previously how this relates to some work going on in the cfrg and then we have almost an hour at the end here um, to talk about uh, the charter for the working group and, and general discussion to provide input for the security ADs and for the IASG. All right, so we're going to go ahead and hop on to Ecker's presentation here. So Ecker, if you could grab the slides. Slides, but it does not seem to be having any impact. So I think you have to do something. 
Um, see, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I'm actually, um, despite what it says on the uh, on the agenda, I'm going to merge the discussion of the things we're trying to accomplish with the discussion of technology, um, because I think it's easier to understand the, the, the motivated cases. So I'll just fold them right in rather than having a separate use cases uh, presentation. Um, so uh, um, uh, I'll say I sent a link. I, um, I've written up quite a bunch of introductory material on this. So if people want to read that, I sent a link in the Java chat. Um, um, and obviously, if something is unclear, please stop me and and you know ask. Um, so okay, let's move on. Um, so they, I, I like to start. So like, here's just like the, the traditional like this is what I'm going to talk about, kind of in order. Um, first, I want to talk about like the kinds of things like one actually wants to measure in these typical settings. And then I want to talk about um, something called what, what anonymous measurement, which is like one approach you might take to it. And then I want to talk about um, the kind of multi-party cryptographic techniques that are the focus of this um, of this buff. Um, and then I'll sort of talk about the technical architecture for the protocol that we sort of developed that are hoping to you know pull in in this work. Um, that's about all the side posting I plan to do. So there's a lot of situations where like one would like to learn about that about people, right? Um, you know, we have like the, the census um, where, you know, there's a lot of public research, um, you know, and you learn things like demographics and, and you know, people's income, um, you know, maybe they have medical issues. Um, you know, companies want to do um, product development. So to see what features that, um, you know, people um, use and don't use, um, how much they use them, like are the products not working in some way. Um, and then you often want to take like behavioral measurements, so, like, like, so, um, you know, say you want to discover like new websites that no one knows about or what information people care about. So you can tune your product to be like more like what people actually want. Um, uh, so, I mean, there was a good example of this on um, the other day um, uh, um, when Brave did some posting about like their new search engine and how they like want to discover websites for the search engine. Um, so, um, um, so all these problems involve like collecting data. Um, um, the information, of course, is like very useful. But it also um, is, you know, can be very, very sensitive. Um, you know, people often don't want to and shouldn't have to disclose, you know, their medical issues in order. In order, you know, if we want to learn how many people have some medical condition. Um, you know, that's 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 good because we want to know, you know, where where funding should be targeted, for instance. But we don't want to know what individuals have, like, you know, medical conditions. That's like bad news, right? Um, same thing is true for your income, sexual orientation, all those things. Um, uh, someone is unmuted, maybe Peter, um, if you could. Um, I know it's not me because I'm not typing. Um, um, and um, you know, it turns out that like not only the things you naturally think of sensitive sensitive, but even like much less sensitive data can be very revealing. And of course, this is like how ad targeting works. Um, and it turns out that there's like a lot of um, a, a, a lot of like evidence that um, you can put like less sensitive data together. Um, this is often called like um, uh, um, high dimensional sparse data sets and figure things out that people would be surprised. And so I had this, this is, you know, from an article a few years ago um, about, you know, target inferring, um, you know, a, a girl was pregnant um, by like looking her other, other sort of pushing behavior. Um, so um, there's been a lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, research on this um, and one would hope to do better. Um, and so like the, the historical way that, um, you know, one does these things is that you just gather all the data and then get promised not to disclose it. Um, and you know this is like um, not, not working out super well. Um, and, you know, data breaches. Um, there's this the famous case of the census information being used for targeting um, Japanese Americans during World War II. Um, and so generally, it'd be better have a system that does not involve just like trusting someone to like handle the data appropriately. Um, so the good news is that actually the data that you want to know is not necessarily sensitive. Um, the data you want to know is usually what's called aggregates. So say you want to know the distribution of people's income, maybe in a particular region. Or maybe you want to look at the relationship between like income and height, which by the way, there is one. Um, or you want to know what the most popular websites are. But I don't care like what websites any individual goes to. What I care about is like what websites people in aggregate go to. And in fact, it's often not useful to learn the websites that any individual goes to because maybe a lot of them are very low card now and they don't care about popular. Um, Often you need to like slice the data in multiple ways. So you say, um, look, I just want to look at a given region, or when I compare two variables, I want to regress them against each other. So in these cases, um, you know, it's, as I say, it's actually not useful to have um, to have the individual data um, beyond what lets you compute these aggregate metrics. And um, and of course, it's very harmful to the individual data if you misuse it. And from the perspective of a researcher, not only um, you know, it's not just a matter of um, it's not just a matter of uh, 
uh, of, of harmful, but it's a matter of dangerous because now you have to have all sorts of controls and procedures around handling the data that make it very hard to work with. Um, and of course, also it makes it people unwilling to you know share the data with you if they know if they think you're not going to handle it responsibly. So um, you know, while there are situations in which it is necessary to gather full data and then just say, look, you have to trust me. Um, those situations are ones we should avoid rather than foster. Um, so. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the kinds of uh, sort of kind of output measurements um, you, you might want. Um, uh, there's a number of common measurement tasks um, that, um, that that we're hoping to achieve in, in this working group. Um, so the first is what's often called a simple aggregates. This is the stuff you would like learn in, a, in an intro task class of you know um, you know uh, uh, single figures of single group statistics that capture some data. So you have mean, median, sum, history, that kind of thing. Um, then there's sort of like um, you know. Uh, Relationships between values, um, correlation coefficients, um, ordinary squares, um, that kind of stuff. Um, and um, um, you know, people often talk about like federated machine learning. That's kind of out of scope for this, but um, simple stuff is, is in scope. Um, and um, and then there's um, this, this specific problem that's often called heavy hitters, which is collecting our common strings that a lot of people have. That turns out to be a very useful technique for number number settings. Um, so like I say, you can notice that these are all like the aggregate things. I don't depend on any, anybody's individual data. Um, so we just like to find some way to gather those these aggregates without having to be infected by people's individual data, which is like basically toxic waste at some level. Um, so like, let me give you like one motivating use case. Um, it's very useful to know what kind of sites you should visit, um, because then um, if you're like a web browser, so now we're back to like use cases. If you're like a web browser, you like to know what kinds of sites people visit, so you can make your web browser work well on those sites. And so you can spend and spend time like, okay, but people like really want to watch a lot of videos, so like making video really work is important. Um, now we have like some data on this because we collect like the mechanical data, uh, but like for obvious reasons, um, it's, it's unattractive to know like what topics any individual is interested in because some of those topics, some of those topics are you know, implicate um, information they don't want us to have. Um, and you know, it's, and it's very difficult to um, obviously knowing exactly what sites people go to is problematic, but even knowing the interest people have is problematic because you can infer other things about them. And um, and so there's been a lot of work and, and, and trying to figure out like exactly what information is sensitive and what information is not is extremely difficult because in some cases like some interests are sensitive and in some cases people think others are just not sensitive and so um, there's been a lot of talk about this um, in the ads context of like what topics are safe um, but like in ideal world if you didn't care about privacy what you want to do is like bucket the sites by topic and then count the number of like minutes on each topic um, but like I said we can't just do that. But so this, but there's another problem statement is to collect the distribution of time spent on each type of site without actually seeing the um, individual types people are. Um, so that's like one motivating use case. Another motivating use case, again, for a browser um, is to see which websites are having problems of one kind or another. Um, in some cases, these problems are, um, I guess, innocuous. Um, so like web compatibility is a big problem. Some sites just don't render properly. And like Mozilla operates like a thing which you can like, press in the upper right-hand corner of your browser somewhere. It says like, this site is broken for me. Um, uh, but like, but we depend pretty heavily on people volunteering that information because we obviously don't want to collect what URL everybody's going to. Um, this is like a big, bigger problem for browsers with smaller market shares because things will often work on like one engine, not another. Um, so in many cases, we can detect breakers on the client. We know that something's wrong. Like they try to use a property we know it doesn't exist, or like the user is hitting reload constantly, like, like rage clicking. But we can't do anything about it because like the browser knows, but it can't tell us. Um, and so that's one example. Um, Another example is um, that we know there's a lot of like what's called fingerprinting going on. So a lot of web tracking happens with, um, uh, with cookies, but there's a lot of which happens without cookies. And um, and so what you do is you like have a bunch of JavaScript APIs and you can measure how the browser behaves under the JavaScript APIs. Um, so an example people often talk about is what's called canvas fingerprinting, where you like render some fonts and then you read back from the canvas and that gives you information about like the GPU that uses the machine. So you can use this to build up a like single value, which you can use, use to like follow the user on the internet. Um, so this is like a, a big front tracking that like is not addressed by the kinds of you know third party cookie blocking that browsers like Firefox and Chrome do. Um, this is again off the detectable on the client because you're like, why is this person like doing all like canvas readbacks when like they're not actually displaying anything meaningful, and or like they're actually loading some 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 like script which you know is a tracking script, um, but you just can't like report back for exactly the same privacy reason. So we're stuck in the situation where where if you have like the, the sort of aggregate information about which sites are having problems, you could do something about it. Could you go to the site and you could like download the script and find it yourself? Um, 
but um, but doing that would entail flushing browsing history is problematic. Um, one thing I would say is people often say, like, why don't you just do a scraper? Um, and you certainly can do that sometimes. Um, but there are two problems. One is building a scraper that collects that much information is very expensive. And the second is that it's very easy to detect when someone has a scraper. And, and if so, especially in these um, in these uh, uh, fingerprinting cases, they could just send you different different data. Um, so again, the problem statement is to collect on the sites where the client is seeing some issue, but only to see the hot ones and only to see and not to see individually, um, you know, what you just are going to, but just to pick the sites that are most problematic in one way or another. Um, and I'm just going to sort of preview um, the, the rest of the people here. We're talking about um, a number of other use cases. I guess I, I hit this first one, so I, I should have like um, removed that. My slides got changed. Um, but there's a bunch, a bunch of talk, I think, uh, other use cases involving both some advertising work and also some work on um, COVID exposure notification measurement. Um, so um, you'll see those later. But I mean, this is just to give you a sense of the breadth of the kind of problem we have here, which is like, all kinds of, of sensitive measurements you want to collect. Um, that uh, unfortunately are difficult to collect with, pri uh, with privacy, with, uh, like without fancy technology of the kind we're trying to develop here. Um, so um, it's important to recognize there actually are two kinds of privacy threats with these kinds of data collections. The first is when you collect sensitive data and it's directly tied to identifying information. So you say, look, I like, you know, did a survey and like I called people on the phone and they told me, you know, they sent me this sensitive stuff. And now like I have the phone number and like, you know, they told me like, you know, whether they, whether they have a particular medical condition. Um, so that's that's like a direct tie, right? Um, and, so, um, and, and then there's, but there's also this thing, um, what's called um, uh, basically this goes back to um, this high dimensional data sets is often if you collect enough non-sensitive information um, and then you collect one piece of sensitive information, you can use the non-sensitive information to figure out who the person is. And so there's this like famous observation to go to Sweeney that like, if you just have five digits of code, gender and date of birth, you can identify like most of the population in the United States. Um, and so um, generally, and, and there's like, was a bunch of, bunch of work also by, um, by um, uh, Arvind Narian um, about this Netflix data set where they're able to find like people's, uh, you know, pe who people were by the Netflix, Netflix browsing history or viewing history. So um, we have to solve both these problems. Uh, so the naive thing that people often talk about doing is basically what's called anonymized data collection. And this is absolutely a viable technique and, and there's a bunch of work going on about it um, in Ohio Working Group. And the basic idea is to strip off all the identifying that information and um, and so what the client does, the client like end-to-end -end encrypts um, the data to the collector. And then you have some proxy in the middle that removes all the metadata like the IP address. Um, and so this, um, this avoids the collector like seeing th that meta information, but still gets, and because the data is encrypted, the proxy never sees the report so that these things are split up. Um, and we talked about, about the trust model for that, so I won't go into that in much detail. Um, and so there are a number of ways to do this. You can do this with like connection level proxies like MASK or IPsec or 20 instances, or you can do it with an application level proxy like OHI. Um, so like this is a very good technique for a number of cases. It's really good for like sort of boosting the privacy of semi-sensitive data, like data you collect anyway. You say, well, like I wish to have the IP address, you can get rid of it. And so it's very common now for like browsers to collect telemetry and we have the IP address, which you just throw away. And so we're great not to have that at all. Um, there are also a bunch of cases where um, you want to collect individual values um, and these free from data blobs that you want to really dig into. Um, it's also like the only way to do things that need an answer. So if you like actually want to have not just like data collection, data collection, but you also want to have um, data reports, like you can't do that. That's, you don't you know, hide for that. Um, and, you, and the techniques we're talking about don't do that. Um, but there's a bunch of cases where it doesn't work well. Um, and, and, the, and the most common cases are um, you can't, it's not good for like these high dimensionality data sets where you need to like take multiple values and put them together. And, um, and the problem is that, um, goes back to what I was saying before, if, if you give me like even the innocuous demographic information, I use it to identify the person. And so if you give me this data set that for instance consists of, you know, of like your zip code and your birth date and your income, well, I can map that back to you. I know your income. So I can't do it. So I can't use this if I want to do this kind of correlation because I'm forced to demographic information that sells that fine. Um, it's, and, and the same thing is true if you want to do like cross tabs and some, and some groups. Um, it's also not good for collecting um, this kind of heavy hitter stuff. And the reason is because the, the even though the data is anonymized, you get all the values, even the low cardinality values. And a lot of the low cardinality values are problematic. So they might be, for instance, you know, um, you know, Google capability or else. Um, so the good news is over the past 10 years, we've done cryptographic techniques, which can solve these problems. Um, and um, there's a bunch of fancy crypto, which I'm going to really only only vaguely sketch. Um, but the basic idea is a multi-party computation. 
So um, you, uh, the, the, what the client does is the client um, wants to report some value and it takes the value and it splits it up into two, two shares with a secret sharing technique of some kind. Um, and the way the shares are constructed is that knowing only one share doesn't give you any information about the other, about the, about the aggregate value. And that, that splitting is what's called information theoretically secure. Maybe it doesn't depend on computational assumptions. Um, um, but um, when you put the shares together, they of course represent the entire value. So what you do, the, each client sends like one share to one server, another share to another server. And then the, the servers take the shares themselves and they aggregate them. They compute the aggregate value. But again, you're just working on the partial data. So you're not learning anything. And then you could take the aggregate. So like, say, for instance, you want the sum, you get a partial sum. And then you could take each partial sum and you can put them together and you get the final output. And so the, the key point here is that you could do all this work um, you know, without ever having anybody see any anybody's individual value. Um, so let like, me like just pause for a second before I start to talk about the, uh, the crypto, which is the trust model, um, because this is like really important. I know this comes up a lot when we talk about these systems. So um, the client's requirement is the two servers do not collude. Um, if the two servers collude, they can be individual values and, the and it's game over, right? Um, and um, so um, the servers have to be operated by different people, obviously, and the, and the client has to trust exactly one of them. Um, the client the, 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 is great if the client trusts both, but as long as one of them doesn't cheat, it's fine. And you can do n servers, but two is the most common number, obviously. The servers also have to, for various reasons, do a little bit of enforcement about like minimum batch sizes and query limits and stuff like that to avoid some attacks that we won't talk about here. Um, for the collector's requirement, both servers have to actually be executing protocol correctly because either server can like distort the results if they don't. But again, this is only a correctness requirement that, um, that only one server is required to be here correctly from the client's perspective. Um, so, I just want to recognize right up front, it's like difficult to verify from the client's perspective that the servers aren't colluding. Um, the collusion can happen through side channels. Um, uh, depending on the architecture, sometimes it's, the side channels are small, sometimes they're big. Um, you can do point in time audits to verify that someone is behaving correctly, um, but you can't, uh, but it's like not possible for them to be not colluding. Um, and I just want to like, I, so like, I want to highlight that. Um, but I also want to say that, like, this is like a very, very common scenario on the internet where you, where people have data and you have to trust them to behave correctly. I mean, if you think about, like, you know, your data is in Gmail, like, you know, Google has like an entire mail record, right? And you're trusting them to behave correctly. Um, and you know, even you know, even if the software is running on your machine, like, uh, you know, um, generally people think of that as behaving correctly. But like, your ability to verify the software running on your device is extraordinarily limited. And so, like. While it be, while like it would be great to have a situation in which you never had to trust anybody, that's simply not the situation most of us find ourselves in. So what we're talking about here is trying to like alleviate the situation of to trust people and make the number of people have to trust smaller or the number of people have to cheat larger. I guess um, we're not talking about eliminating trust entirely. It's just not possible at this state in our technological development. And so we're trying to improve the situation, but we're not trying to like boil the ocean. Um, so. Um, I want to talk like very briefly about like one cryptographic protocol to give you a sense of like the situation. Um, this is sort of the, the one that started it off. It's called Prio, um, and it's useful for computing like numeric aggregates, like sum and mean that kind of thing. And like this is like the one that's like, most apprehensible. Um, and like we're going to punt the crypto to CFRG, but this one is like understandable like normal humans. So we assume each client has some value, like it's a numeric value, and like call it X of I, right? And so the client does is the client splits up that value in, in the following way. It generates a random value. Um, uh, sorry about the fancy math, but basically, a random value is uh, smaller than a prime. And then it basically does. It sends server one like the value minus the random value module of the prime, and it sends server two the random value. And it's like it's quite easy to convince yourself that if you know that oh knowing the random value is not enough, and knowing uh, and knowing um, that the, the, the subtraction is not enough, and that is sufficient. So now each server takes all the shares I get from everybody and add them up, right? Um, and again, like because 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 these are like information theoretically, they're not like anything. And then they and then they basically exchange the exchange the sums, or really like one sends the sum to the other, probably. And then if you take the sums and you add them up, um, and you like do a bunch of like bunch of like relatively simple like you know middle school math, you can just convince yourself because addition is commutative, that when you add the sums up, you actually get the sum of the initial values. Um, so like mission accomplished. We done all, all this all this computation and zero knowledge, and we have the output at the end. Um, so this is like, this seems like really boring and like kind of obvious. Um, and, but it's actually a fantastically powerful. And the reason is because there's a lot of things you can actually compute with just this sum thing. As long as you encode the data properly, you can compute all kinds of things as sums. So like arithmetic mean is obvious, it's sum divided by count. Product, you compute product by doing some of the logs. Geometric mean is compute from product. 
You can do variance and standard deviation by computing some some of the values of some of the squares. There's a bu and there's a bunch of fancy stuff for doing like or and min max and even ordinary least squares. So the trick is just finding the right encoding. And there's like papers now about how to do all this stuff. Um, so one problem that people immediately say is like, what about bogus data, right? And there are actually two kinds of bogus data. There's plausible data, but it's actually false. So like I'm like about like 175 centimeters tall, but may I say I'm 180, right? Um, this is like a problem with any surveying technique, unless you call the data yourself and you just live with it. You just live with the noisy data, right? Because people don't lie consistently. Um, and then there's like consistent, completely ridiculous data, or I like say like I'm a kilometer tall, or worse, I say like I'm negative kilometer tall, right? And ordinarily what you do is you just like have some filter mechanism where you said, um, you know, uh, you just said like, well, I, I I just reject anything. This is a kilometer tall, right? And but like with the previous data is encrypted, so you can't do that, right? And so, um, uh, um, and so instead, what you do is like, and this is the fancy math part. Each submission comes with a zero knowledge proof of validity, and the proof says something like this height report is like between like 100 and 200 centimeters, right? The servers work together to validate the proof, and you only aggregate the submissions that have valid proofs, right? So like you have to trust me, this part works, but like um, this part works. Um, um, but it's important to remember that this part, believing this part works, does not, not necessarily required for believing privacy. The privacy claim comes the previous things. Um, you, uh, the you do with zero knowledge proofs don't meet the data. Um, so, okay, so like going back to my use cases, right? Um, uh, say I want to collect these user interests, right? So basically, the way you collect user interests with thing like Preo is that every user interest is a bucket, and you have like I don't know, 100, 200, 500 buckets, right? And the client individually reports time spent in each bucket. You have to report the ones that are zero too, by the way, otherwise you can just look at which buckets are reported. And then you use pre sum up and you end up with a bunch of sums, one for each bucket, and now you know exactly how much aggregate time was spent on each bucket, for each bucket, but you don't have anybody's individual time spent. Um, and as I know, you can always you can also um, uh, um, report T squared, and you can do standard deviation as well. So um, this is like a pretty straightforward application of something like pre-op. Um, but there's like a whole pile of use cases that basically come into this. Um, okay. Um, so um, uh, even more fancy is a protocol um, called heavy hitters. Um, well, actually, they didn't name it. So like we've been calling it hits. Um, and the idea, uh, so the idea is that like each client submits a string, um, like a URL, and you want to output the end most frequent strings. And I'm going to like very, very aggressively hand wave this. But the basic idea is that the servers can jointly compute the number of strings that any given prefix p. And so what you do is you start with like basically, you just do binary search. So you start with like, Strings start with zero, and you say how many strings start with zero versus start with one. And then, okay, fine, now we'll keep going down the tree until I've gotten down to whatever threshold I want to. And so you can just find all the values and effectively all the important values and basically log in tries. Um, and I will not even remotely attempt to explain how this works. Um, I, you know, I understood it for about the amount of time I understood quantum physics when I was in college. Um, um, so, but like, um, again, this is like well understood math at this point. Um, so going back to my use cases again, this you can just have to like this for conducting broken sites, right? Each client creates one report for each site which is broken or which is fingerprinting, and they use hits to determine the top sites. And this just and the servers just spit out the list of all the important sites, but you don't learn who reported them, and you don't learn not any sites that aren't important because the servers just won't descend the tree once the cardinality is below a certain value. So um, so again, this is like an example of how you can use this for like a real world application that like we actually really care about. Um, so um, I, I, I do one thing I want to like flag is um, that there um, is a, a, a there's this issue called subset query, um, which is um, uh, that so submissions could, I just giving you examples or, or I'm just giving you submissions that like have one piece of information, but you can also tag the submissions with the demographic data because like birth dates or code initials and these things we're talking about right, and those get passed on all the way to the, to the, to the aggregators right, and this is like. This is notionally safe because you say that the non nonsense information is safe, or you you only collect nonsense information, and then the and the OD is encrypted. But then you can say, okay, compute an aggregate over the subsets. Um, so that's like a very powerful technique. It's one reason why this is like a, a powerful technique in ways that like Ohio is not. Um, but of course, it means that repeated queries can be used to determine individual values by like querying for the subset, like includes them and then excludes them. Um, there's some defenses against this. Um, Having minimum batch sizes, anti-replay, um, randomization for differential privacy. Um, this is a piece of work the working groups have to work on. That's part of why this is completely done. Uh, but I think we well understood how to do pieces of this um, for for some some measurements and the other ones that you're going to need some more work. Um, so what is the state of the play here? Um, 
a number of us, um, some of the people you're representing, have basically developed um, a generic protocol um, that is designed for doing privacy peer measurement. Uh, what I mean by generic is that um, it's, a, it's a framework protocol that then you can plug in um, uh, you know, individual cryptographic technologies. Um, so it's compatible with a bunch of these things called verifiable should be aggregation functions, which, which we'll be talking about. Um, but um, initially, it's tuned to work with uh, pre-O and heavy hitters. Um, it's built on top of HTTPS. It's going to smell a lot like you know any REST kind of protocol like Acme or whatever you've seen before. And so it's easy to implement with existing services and infrastructure. And and but a lot of people working on this, like um, you know having work have, from really infrastructure, so the design to make, work well with this. Um, so the um, um, so, I mean, just to give you like a system architecture picture, um, this is what it looks like, you know, there's a bunch of clients, they send their shares, and then there's like a leader, and and um, the leader like basically takes the shares and parses them out to the helpers and orchestrates the whole computation, and then the data is like sent to a collector, and so the collector can say, look, give me like the output for this, this subset of the system, um, and then it spits the results out, right? And so one way to think about this, um, and I think you know, there's a number of different playing models that's compatible with, um, one of which is that, you know, the collector and the leader are the same person, and they're trying to do the data collection, and they outsource the helper job to one other person so that they can make guarantees about the privacy of the system. Um, another possibility is the whole is the whole like leader collector helper box is like a service that's provided to people. Um, the trust model here you should be assuming is that the clients have to know what the helpers and the leader are. And so the clients know who the who, who the who the data is being encrypted for, and so they can make their own assessment of whether or not they, they trust one of those people. Um, though, of course, in a real world scenario, what's most likely to happen is that the clients are deployed by some by the collector effectively, and the collector hardwires the leader and the helper, and so the the, you know, the user of the service can inspect who those people are, but it's not like they actually choose them in any meaningful way. Um, so, um, you know, people are naturally going to ask, like, what, like, the situation with OHI is, um, because OHI, as I mentioned, is, is useful for many of these kinds of settings. Um, these are complements, they're not substitutes. So, um, you know, good cases for OHI are, like, as I say, sort of semi-sensitive data. This were kind of rich, freeform data that, like, you couldn't really, you know, aggregate this way. Um, um, anything, of course, that needs any kind of response at all, right? Because, like, none of this technology gives you a response. It just measures. Um, good cases for PPM are, like, really sensitive data. Um, Hopefully, simpler data because, like, as, as you sort of probably getting the idea, it's not like really easy to like do really complicated stuff. Um, and settings where you need to kind of do drill down, you need to do regression, or you need to do subset co correspondence, that kinds of things. Um, um, so, like, these are like you know, these are these are two great cases to create together, right? You can use OHI to talk to PPM server, thus like boosting the privacy of the system. So, like, you say, okay, well, I do want to collect this data, but I actually store it at IP address, so you can remove that as well. Um, and so, um, and in fact, I think uh, you'll see you'll see some of the um, uh, uh, some of that in like later talks. Um, you can also use um, uh, sort of a, a front-end proxy server um, to do a bunch of like, um, you know, kind of misuse detection of like, you know, uh, spamming attacks and stuff like that. So um, so I think, you know, these are complementary techniques and not, 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 not competitive techniques, which is why you see some of the same people working on them. Um, I don't know why, oh yeah, right. Um, I was like, why well, do I have two more slides? So I'm now done. I think I hit my target time target quite well. Um, I have a little time for questions, which I'd be happy to take. Oh, I do want to say one more thing, um, but while I'm waiting to see if anybody wants to say anything, which is our assumption is the VDAF functions we standardized are, are, are defined in CFRG, not an ITF. And so the idea is we'll build the framework here and we'll defer that work of defining the VDAFs to CFRG, and that work is already partly going on, or at least being, is being presented to CFRG. Wes. Pause. Thanks. Uh, good presentation. I enjoyed um you laid it out really well. The one thing that I'd like to hear more about is sort of the deployment scenario. For example, on slide 14, don't go back. You you specifically said the client wants to report some value, right? So w would your expectation be that uh, application authors and, and, and servers would sort of make use of this in the same way that sort of OHI is considering being deployed by, you know, various organizations to get into stuff or that, you know, DOE is being used for, if for everything, you know, DNS. I mean, how do you, where would this be deployed? Because the client actually, if the, if the client is a user, right, they're clueless. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, so I think, I think the most likely settings for this initially will be the kind of like, um, the kind of measurements that like people are already taking via the software to disseminate. So, um, you know, things like browser telemetry, um, uh, you know, um, 
uh, I think um, that the the case of the case of that 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 um, uh, Tim will be talking next involves um, measurement of cover exposures. Um, and yeah, those things are all being done like sort of un, sort of like um, you know automatically, um, you know, potentially by asking the user automatically by, by the software. I think there's some possibility that in the future, um, you know, you'd see like this use for surveying, for direct surveying, where you say like, hey, you know, are you willing to participate in surveys and then we'll, we'll, we'll let down the client and you can do it. But I mean, like, you know, the, the uh, I mean, I think, yeah, the, uh, you know, these are, pull, these are pull techniques, not push techniques fundamentally. Um, um, and I think, you know, obviously cryptographically it's so complicated that the user has to involve some piece of software to do it. Do you have a use case today that that should not be used with Ohio that this would be a better for that's like already in your head for you know I want this now? Yeah, yeah. Um. So I think uh, so. So I think uh, um the uh so so certainly the um uh the, the use case of measuring sort of misbehaving websites um it basically cannot be cannot be contained with Ohio because you um because you learn the uh, um. Is you'll, you'll learn a bunch of the uh, you don't want to learn any of the low cardinality sites. Those, those are very dangerous, right? Because um, if you like collect like every URL somebody goes to, even if it's misbehaving, um, then there's a real probability that you learn a bunch of like say Google Docs, um, you know, capability URLs, or you learn you know you know some document called like, this is like my plan to buy company A, you know. Um, um, so yeah, so, ba so basically like anything that involves that, that kind of like string data collection is very problematic with Ohi. Um, also, even like the sort this sort of bucketized. Um, you know, uh, um, you know, give me counters of being 80, 80 counters, like really problematic with a high, um, because basically you have to disaggregate every single value and report it separately. Otherwise, you end up in a situation where you can do, build these high dimensional data sets and use them to do, to do production. So, like, those are both cases where a high does not perform particularly well. Though the second, like, you could maybe get away with, but it's, it's probably problematic. Andrew. I uh, just by way of clarity, since Ohio has come up quite a lot uh, um, in the chat as well as in your presentation, um, uh, where you said complementary, there's no dependency uh, on no. Ohio here. Yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. That's just worth being absolutely clear on that. Thanks. No, not at all. Thank you. Okay, chairs, I, 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 I'll hang around, but like I think that we're done, right? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, so just for avoidance of confusion, the, the Mozilla use cases were bolted into Acris presentation. That's correct, yes. The case, I mean, I didn't cover everything we're interested in doing, but those two things we're interested in doing, yes. Right, so we're going to roll into uh, Tim now. Uh, if you go ahead and grab the slides, excellent. Oh, that's the wrong slide. Oh, I thought, <clears throat> excuse me, I thought you were going to uh, put the slides up. So uh, I, can... I, can, I can run them if you want me to. Or yeah, would you? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure how to upload them in minor, nice and simple anyway. Thank you. Sure. Um, um, okay, I'll actually, dive I in. I to release. Oh, I've got it. There we go. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so let's get started. Uh, my name is Tim, uh, and I'm an engineer at the Internet Security Research Group. Uh, we're the nonprofit that operates the Let's Encrypt Certificate Authority. Um, not to be confused with the IRSG, incidentally. Uh, the dilemma that uh, Mr. Riscorla just introduced in which the essential function of gathering telemetry from the field introduces significant privacy risks for users is of great interest to the ISRG, uh, given our mission of reducing barriers to secure and private communications on the internet. Um, next slide, please. So Ecker covered that, uh, you know, the ways in which telemetry is a privacy risk for users and the, you know, the implied benefits to users of um, using these new technologies. But I think it's worth noting that uh, many data collectors also want to do the right thing and respect the privacy of their users. Besides that being a decent thing to do, um, the large amount of personally identifying information stored by conventional telemetry systems is a significant liability for the data collector. Um, there's new privacy regulations emerging in various jurisdictions all the time, which require expensive and complicated controls around user data. Um, and all that PII makes for a very, very tempting target for attackers. Um, so we have these new tools like Creo and Heavy Hitters, but uh, even those organizations with pretty formidable engineering departments who have the wherewithal to explore these techniques are in kind of a jam because you need an external trusted partner to execute these multi-party protocols. Um, so ISRG is interested in providing private measurement aggregation as a public service to the internet for a lot of the same reasons that we built Let's Encrypt. We want to make it easy to do the right thing. Uh, next slide, please. 
So we envision running a standards compliant aggregator as a service uh, with the same focus on automation and ease of integration that drive Let's Encrypt. We expect that uh, some customers will want to run their own aggregator and have it work with ours, but others will want to avoid running any servers at all and will instead choose two existing aggregators, say one run by ISRG and one run by some other organization or company that you know, chooses to participate. Um, so in support of that, we, we are hoping to provide an open source implementation of a PPM aggregator with the aim of making it easy for some data collector to interoperate with ISRG's aggregator or anybody else's. So hopefully uh, it ends up being a matter of grabbing a container image from some public registry, you deploy it into your existing you know, Kubernetes cluster or whatever you have, and you can start gathering private telemetry cheaply and easily. Um, somewhat akin to how the EFF cert bot can be easily deployed alongside your existing web server um, to have it manage Let's Encrypt TLS certificates. We are also uh, aiming to provide open source client libraries targeting like a variety of languages and frameworks uh, chosen to you know, facilitate adoption for the most likely interested parties. So you, know, you can imagine like a Swift SDK for iOS apps, uh, JavaScript for, web app for a single page application on the web, uh, and so on. Um, so, right, so with this goal in mind, uh, an open standard uh, through the IETF is uh, acutely valuable because a proprietary single vendor solution wouldn't be terribly useful since the privacy guarantees are contingent upon independent and non-colluding aggregators. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So, we talked a lot about, you know, the benefits of these new technologies, but uh, there are some trade-offs, some drawbacks to these uh, systems. So for one thing, there are more servers involved, so it's more likely to, more likely to fail, uh, somewhat necessarily. Second, the uh, verification of the proofs that uh, Vedekar that introduced earlier um, do introduce some computational network overhead. And in particular, we'll introduce, depending on which, which uh, protocol, which VDAF is in use, we'll introduce uh, potentially multiple rounds of communication between the aggregating servers. Uh, finally, um, metrics gathered under these schemes are really, these schemes are necessarily less flexible than conventional telemetry systems. Uh, you can't make arbitrary post hoc queries. Sorry, you can't make arbitrary queries post hoc against your, your corpus of data. Um, you have to know upfront before you begin collecting any data what are the aggregations you're interested in computing. Uh, this has to do with the construction of the proofs, um, as well as enforcing some of the privacy guarantees of the system. Um, fortunately, you know, in spite of all these challenges, we do have some evidence that this stuff actually works and at scale. So in December of 2020, uh, a collaboration between Apple, Google, uh, we at the ISRG, the Linux Foundation Public Health Initiative, the MITRE Corporation, and the National Cancer Institute at the National Institutes of Health um, in, in the United States, uh, launched the Exposure Notifications Private Analytics System. Um, and this is the back end to Apple and Google's Exposure Notifications Express, um, which is a system, of course, for COVID exposure notifications. So, uh, so EN, Exposure Notifications, of course, is the system by which uh, mobile devices can uh, sort of anonymously exchange with each other expo uh, COVID exposure. ENPA allows back anonymously and privately backhauling that data to a regional public health authority so that they can get information on how many people are getting the notifications, how many people are uh, on their mobile devices, how many people are interacting with them, uh, and all sorts of interesting metrics about the spread of COVID itself, as well as the effectiveness of the, of the EN system. So this is currently deployed in 13 US states and the District of Columbia, and at the moment it's gathering 2.1 million measurements per hour. Uh, we also heard last night to throw in one more interesting number that uh, sometime over the night, we gathered uh, 12 billion individual uh, metrics that have been aggregated since the system launched. Um, we're also about to deploy this internationally, so uh, beyond the United States. So we're hoping to soon turn this on in uh, uh, four states in Mexico. Okay, I'm already well over time, so I will uh, see the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. All right, uh, Martin, you're up next. Do you want to run your slides? You want me to? We can't hear you, Martin. I have slide. Talking, I can just press instead. That was kind of broken up. I am sorry. Is that coming through better now, or we? I can hear you now. Yes, thanks. Oh, yeah, it takes some time. Uh, where are we?
I have to thank the uh, people who provided the preview on selecting these slides because all of these slides have the same titles. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk very briefly about some of the uh, use cases in advertising, specifically the conversion measurement one. I think Charlie's going to follow up with some more details on, on this one. So um, conversion measurement is something that happens on the web quite a bit. Uh, when, when someone shows an advertisement, it's kind of nice to know if that advertisement is having the intended effect. And so the goal here is to measure how many people buy the widget when they saw the ad. And how many buy the, how many people buy the widget without seeing the ad? How many people see the ad without buying the widget? All those sorts of things, um, and combinations of of those things for different uh, campaigns and and whatnot. Uh, this information flows to both the advertisers, the ad tech companies, and those people who who actually sell the inventory or put the advertisements on their websites. So. Key question here is, is the money I'm spending on all this advertising actually having an effect on me making more money? So the way this works today is pretty simple. Uh, we assign a user an identifier, so everyone gets their own unique identifier. And every time they visit a website and an advertisement is shown or they do something, then we just create a little, little log record that records all the details from the context and their user identifier, timestamps, all those sorts of other things. And then you look at the log and you can answer all sorts of questions about what people have done. It's, um, it's really great for getting the information that you need. It's all quite precise, um, leaving aside all of the complications of anti-fraud and all those sorts of other things. You can answer all the questions that you have fairly precisely. However, um, that doesn't really respect people's privacy. And so the idea behind uh, some of the efforts uh, that we're talking about here is to produce aggregate statistics about conversions uh, without relying on user-specific uh, logs. That means you get counts rather than individual records. Uh, Current status of this work is that there's lots and lots of requirements that are coming through. Uh, this is obviously a lot more complicated when it comes into practice. There's lots of ideas. People have all sorts of wonderful proposals and uh, some competing requirements. But uh, a lot of the really promising ideas include something like what Eka described earlier. And the simple example here. Uh, is probably the one that is easiest to understand. You have an event that occurs, someone views an ad. You have a, another event that occurs, they buy an item, as maybe that's connected to that particular ad. And those are two independent events. And you can imagine those events going into some sort of opaque box that's operated by, say, their browser or something like that. And you add up some numbers and maybe you add up a one if there was an ad shown and the person bought the thing and if there was no ad shown you add up a zero you get those reports from thousands and thousands of people and feed them through a system like brio or one of those other things and you get back a count of the number of people who saw the ad and bought the product and that allows you to make some uh, conclusions about how you how your business has been operating and the advertising campaigns you're running. Obviously, this gets a lot more complicated, but uh, we'll let Charlie explain some of that. Any questions on this part? Okay, so is that is that the end of your presentation? That is it. Okay, so let's go ahead and bring uh, Charlie on then. Charlie, do you want me to do your slides, or do you want to run them? Uh, I think I can run them. Let me see. 
ask to share slides. And let's see if this works. Great. You guys can see it? Yep. OK, great. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Charlie Harrison. I'm a software engineer working at Google. Uh, looking at PPM-like solutions for doing ads measurement on the web uh, to, to satisfy similar use cases that Martin was just talking about. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of breeze through some of the background just because there's a lot of overlaps with Martin's slide. But I, I think the gist here is that here at Google, uh, we think third-party cookies are not great for users' uh, users' privacy, um, but uh, they're kind of right now like critical infrastructure that powers online ads, um, for exactly the reason Martin mentioned. Uh, and the the problem that we're trying to kind of grapple with is whether we can build something like a third-party cookie alternative that gives users good privacy while still kind of supporting this like critical infrastructure to some extent. Um, and I think the key insight here uh, is that, um, at least as it relates to PPM, is that like many ads use cases are actually like totally fine with aggregate data and they don't actually need to track you kind of around the web and learn all the data exactly. Um, we, we could be fine with aggregate data in many cases. Uh, so I, I want to go over just in a little bit more detail how attribution measurement, which is also called conversion measurement, um, happens today with cookies. Essentially, uh, and I, I'm sure this is going to be familiar for many people, uh, what happens is that you typically have an ad tech uh, site that is like running on a website and that drops cookies on, uh, sets cookies that are readable basically from anywhere, from any website. Um, this allows you basically to keep track of like a mega identifier sort of, which is this third party cookie, which is uh, tags the user or the user's device with an identifier, which uh, is readable from multiple different contexts. So you will read this cookie when an ad is placed and you'll also read this cookie when there's a conversion, like when you buy something later on down the road after you've seen an ad for it. Uh, and so right now, this cookie ID is used as the join key to join these two cross-site events, right? Um, and but they 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 join arbitrary events, so like all of your browsing can be linked up to this one cookie in theory. Uh, how could it be improved? Uh, we could internally join this data in the browser. Um, so when you see an ad, we could register something in like custom new browser storage. Uh, and when you buy something that was like pointed to by that ad, uh, that would join up with that with that event in the internal browser storage. And you could uh, have a communication path from the browser to something like PPM, where we we you know we have this data, we want to compute something like a histogram. Um, maybe we want to learn something like, you know, what are the counts of conversions, like purchases per ad campaign? So the x-axis is ad campaign, the y-axis is the number of conversions. We can we can use PPM to kind of uh, generate a data uh, data share split that encodes that histogram contribution, send that up to PPM, and the ad tech could uh, uh, learn aggregate statistics like just a histogram um, of of the uh, of the counts. And this doesn't reveal any uh, user data directly; it only reveals aggregate. Um, so there are a whole bunch of like cool use cases to think about. Um, I know there was a lot of talk in the chat about um, differential privacy, and this is uh, uh, something, some formal privacy that we could add within the PPM system to ensure that the output of PPM is private. Um, so that's something we're looking into. Um, there's a lot of interesting research that's related to kind of the heavy hitter stuff about how do we re report these histograms when they're like really 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 big like you are running millions of campaigns or you want to do like all sorts of different crosses um we're uh really interested in uh systems that can help train machine learning models um in some cases there's there are results that show that even just aggregate histograms could be used to train like logistic models but like are like we're looking into more sophisticated mechanisms um 
there's uh, uh you know in rather than conversion measurement we could look at reach measurement which is asking like how many distinct users saw my ad across many different websites so this is kind of like removing a uh, like remove duplicates operation um and you know we we're, we're we're interested in exploring like you know we have this conversion measurement thing but maybe there's something that's more generic um that we could use for like a, a more basic browser primitive uh and i think i think that's my time but uh yeah happy to answer questions after the uh everyone else is done thanks very much charlie so now that's the end of the uh the use case uh, presentations so we're going to open the floor briefly to anyone who wants to ask about uh, any of those use cases Okay, so I think we're going to go ahead and move on to Richard now. Thank you. So I sent a request to share slides. Ah, oh, there we go. Yeah. There we go. Share. All right. So yeah, this is this is pretty different. So uh, Ecker talked about protocol. Uh, we had a couple talks about use cases. Um, I'm here to talk about kind of the substrate, um, and the, the the label we are using for this is verifiable distributed aggregation functions. Thanks to Chris Patton for that uh, that name. Context here is that like many things in the in the IETF, we need some complicated crypto for this. And so we're doing some parallel work uh, in CFRG, and it, uh, it goes alongside the uh, crypto, uh, the, the protocol work in the IETF, to kind of uh, to specify the the complicated crypto bits in a place where we can get cryptographers' eyes on them, as opposed to just protocol nerds. Um, just highlighting some some parallels here: uh, TLS, depending on uh, cryptographic primitives that CFRG defines, MLS uh, relies on HPKE, which you did in CFRG. And so for this PPM work, we're defining this VDAF uh, or uh, VDAF, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Uh, that defining this as the kind of cryptographic abstraction that um, that PPM relies on in CFRG. Now, if you look at the draft, it's kind of in two parts. Um, we define an API uh, that is the abstraction PPM is supposed to rely on. So um, the idea is that we have multiple instantiations that do various flavors of this uh, private aggregated measurement dance um, that all behave in a close enough way that we can define a common API over them and build protocol around that API. And this provides a way you know, that we can build a protocol without having to care about the details of the cryptography and provides a target that cryptographers can look at and design new schemes. And if they plug into this API, then they can presumably be used inside of PPM with uh, you know, more quickly and more, more easily than if they'd been um, designed kind of completely from scratch uh, using a new, not, not reusing that construct. So what I'm going to talk about here is mostly the API. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the instantiations um, at the end. Um, so as Ecker outlined, uh, so just, just briefly to define like what we're actually doing here. Um, so the idea of this VDAF is to kind of capture the critical things we need the cryptography to do inside of PPM. So kind of working back to front, the aggregation bit is um, the, the idea that you know, the inputs to this process are individual measurements and what comes out of it at the end is an aggregate measurement over those individual measurements. Distributed in the sense that it's distributed among a bunch of aggregators. Um, the, you know, that the computation of that aggregate is distributed over those aggregators, and the privacy properties of the individual measurements are assured by non-collusion among those aggregators. And finally, it's verifiable in the sense that the aggregators can check that the inputs have uh, meet some properties. Um, as Ecker pointed out, you know, there's risk in this sort of uh, distributed scenario that the measurement results that get reported in by uh, the, the measurement points could be corrupt, it could be invalid, um, they, and they, that could flow through and lead to a garbled aggregate. So we have some checks in here um, that um, allow the aggregators to verify that the measurements they're getting are meet some definition of correctness. Now, which, exactly which definitions you can apply varies a little bit by the instantiation. 
Um, so looking at how this kind of plays out, you know, this is the kind of classic measurement scenario. This is how a lot of telemetry works today, where you, know, you have a client out there, um, you know, actually many clients, but I'm only going to portray one on this, this slide. You have many clients out there collecting uh, measurements of something, you know, where, where people clicked in an application or what, whatnot, and reporting that back to a collector. And the, as you know, you, you've seen various takes on this on the last few, but the idea here is that we're introducing this aggregator tier in between the client and the collector. And the idea of these you know, aggregators is that the client shards their each measurement out um, to uh, you know, individual shards of the aggregators such that you can only make sense of that measurement if you have all the shares. That's how we get that non-collusion guarantee. The aggregators then go through this process of what I've called prepare, the term I use in the draft is preparing the measurements. So that's, that includes um, verifying that the uh, uh, measurements are correct, are, are um, uh, acceptable, that they're correct, um, and you know, transforming them into an aggregatable encoding, uh, perhaps. Uh, that's necessary in some realizations. Um, so once you've kind of taken the individual measurements and prepared them, um, you aggregate them. Um, the, this is kind of where you do that step that um, echoes over. You add up the shares uh, into a share of the sum. And then finally, the aggregators send their uh, aggregate shares over to the collector who unshards them to get the final results. So this is kind of the data flow view of the same thing. Um, I think the interesting thing here from a kind of protocol point of view is you notice there's a kind of back and forth thing at the preparation stage. There is a need for some, some chattiness, um, some interaction between the aggregators in that verification process to enable um, uh, the, a distributed verification of the correctness of the input shares. Um, but otherwise, hopefully this, this kind of explains the overall process. Um, also, this, um, the kind of little gray squares that uh, are parallel to the output shares are, other, are meant to indicate other output shares with the idea that an aggregate share represents the aggregation of uh, the output shares over a batch of measurements. And as, as was pointed out before, it's up to the aggregators to do things like enforce minimum batch sizes, define what a batch is. Um, so that's kind of the data flow. Um, this is how kind of how we've described that API in the draft. Um, again, just kind of using notations here. Um, so basically, you know, what the VDAF draft defines is this API and how a couple of instantiations fulfill that API. And then PPM's job is to do the plumbing to get the inputs and outputs of, of these uh, local uh, functions to the right places at the right time so that at the end of the day, uh, you can unshard into a measurement that's meaningful to the collector. In the draft, we define a couple of constructions. I think uh, Ecker probably described, um, described these in a little bit more detail. Um, Prio is, is the one where we, that I think uh, ENPA is, is based on. Uh, the version in the draft is, is I think, a, a has a few more changes on top of what's in ENPA, but that's one where we have a fair bit of deployment experience. And then the HITS protocol is the one that lets you get uh, distribution on strings. Um, and there's been some discussion in chat about whether, you know, possibly we could fit something like star in here. Um, that's, I mean, it's kind of the idea of the draft is that we can look at not just these two, but also fitting um, other things in under this umbrella so that we can have PPM as a generic construct into which we can fit multiple different cryptographic realizations. Um, there's a few implementations so far. Um, this is kind of, uh, well, we have the one that supports ENPA uh, with Prio v2. Uh, we've got some uh, early implementations of uh, distributed point functions or what supports uh, kind of the inner loop of hits. Um, and there's some work uh, on various Prio inst instantiations. Um, I think one of the things interesting that comes out of this is that we can start to do some measurements of the, um, the cost of doing these algorithms. Um, if you look at the, the papers in which they're published, there's, you know, it might look intimidating in terms of the amount of data that's getting sent around, the amount of computations being done. But with these implementations, we have some early data about the, the expense of, uh, in terms of computation and, and communications overhead of uh, doing these private schemes. And, you know, your mileage may vary, but it seems seem, seems tolerable to first order. <laughs> we'll say that. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I had. Yeah, a couple of references. Thank you very much. That puts us uh, right on schedule again. Uh, much appreciated. So any any questions?
for Richard about any of that. Eric? Hey, um, so in one of your slides, you had the aggregators sort of with lines between them and in the um, PPM spec, I, I mostly see sort of the helpers not connected. Are, are we thinking about a protocol where we might imagine enabling a topology that could have helpers sort of communicating with each other um, like some MPC protocols uh, allow for? Yeah, this slide. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I admit that I'm not an expert on kind of what the PPM protocol is doing right now. I've mainly been stuck down at this layer, but I think my understanding is that you can emulate, you know, this kind of looks like a broadcast channel, and if you have a leader that um, is connected to multiple helpers, you could have basically a star topology that over which you can emulate a broadcast channel. So if, if a helper needs to, it, uh, for, for instance, in the, in the, um, in the, pro, in the uh, API we've sketched out, uh, we structure the preparation process in rounds where the input to each round is uh, the output of the previous round from all uh, aggregators. So I think the, in the PPM uh, contact kind of communications model, you can envision all helpers submitting their outputs from the previous round and then the, the leader distributing those outputs out to all of the helpers for the next round. Kind of yeah, cool. Richard, just, to, to add on to, just to add on to that, yeah, Please. I think basically the, the assumption is that the communication is probably mediated by the leader, um, but that's, that's, that's the assumption it, it's embedded in PPM, not embedded here, and that certainly that turned out to be not a workable function, we figure, out, so figure something out. Yeah, I mean, I think it might be useful for the leader to be able to, you know, uh, coordinate helpers directly connecting to each other just to minimize communication overhead, but as long as that's sort of within scope or or whatnot, or Absolutely. considering, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, we have a. This is this is like a straw man thing. Um, it's not a cool. like like protocol has any changed radically. I imagine. Thank you, Chris Patton. I saw you briefly flash up in the speaker list. Here, did you have a comment? So I don't need to reiterate it. OK, seeing no one else in the queue, thank you again uh, very much, Richard. We're going to go ahead and move on to, um, well, first we're going to call and bring the slides up here. So we're going to move on to a call for expression of interest from folks in this. Um, just just to make sure that there is enough critical mass behind this aside from the people who have presented here uh, we'd like to ask who in attendance is interested in working on this technology um, i'm trying to figure out we probably don't need people to speak to this necessarily although we're very happy to hear what you have to say on the topic um, i'm also going to throw up a quick show of hands There we go. So go ahead, Tommy. Hello. All right. Cool. Um, I, I did the show up. I just wanted to speak a little bit to mention, from my perspective, you know, uh, we definitely have already we're using stuff like this and seeing something like this be standard out and taken on by the working group would be something that would be a positive thing. So, uh, you know, we didn't do any of the presentations here, but we're definitely interested. Thank you. Does anyone else want to stand up and speak specifically to it? That we did get, um, uh, I guess, two things. One that uh, uh, 
I think everybody who is speak is interested in working on this, just so we're all clear. And second, um, uh, uh, if you look at the, um, th there's a bunch of people in the Jabber chat that are saying they're interested, um, including Facebook and whatever you say. Oh, excellent. Thank you. All right. Uh, Robin? Is the audio okay? Yes. Great. Thanks, Adam. Um, yeah, this is, uh, so this is a personal comment rather than anything on ISOC's behalf. Uh, I would be interested in um, at least following the work, and um, I would also have a personal interest in seeing to what extent it can be used to test the the um, growing and increasingly mature body of work on um, what's sometimes called value value based design. So, in in other words, um, what systematic approach can you um, adopt for the design and innovation process? that ensures that ethical factors and values are considered at each relevant step um, and, and i think that would that would help clarify a lot of the comments in the chat about uh, along the lines of yes but this happens already or um well this only works if you can assume there's no collusion and so on um, because what it does is it flushes those assumptions out and lets you determine whether you want to design in a way that is compatible with those behaviors or actually perhaps even conceivably um, inhibits those behaviors. Okay, thanks. Uh, Yari? Yeah, I just wanted to briefly mention that uh, I, I do think this is uh, exciting technology and, and we should work on that. Um, I can see other types of applications. We mostly talked about the uh, sort of application type, uh, browser type of things, but also many types of networks could probably use this, this uh, technology to do a better job at uh, collecting information that needs to be collected for various uh, debugging and uh, other other reasons. The only piece that I was sort of a little bit concerned about was was this advertising piece, and I sort of just uh, as a personal opinion, I had some reservations about the browsers working with advertisers, even though I do recognize the need to do something better than we do today. But uh, you know, maybe there's also other paths for the advertisement problem, trying to, try to prevent information flow rather than collaboration. But uh, I don't work for the advertising in the industry. So anyway, I, I like this. This should go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Wendy? So I, I, we can't hear you, unfortunately. There may be. Um, an incorrect input device selected or something along those lines. Okay. Um, I, I think we probably need to let you try to work that out and um, get back in the queue. Thanks. Uh, Ted? Uh, thanks. Uh, I basically got in the queue to, to, to answer one of the bot questions that's, do I think the problem statement is clear, well-scoped, solvable, and useful to solve? And I think one of the things that kind of worries me about the way it was presented today is that it's talking about what seems to me to be a set of problems and aggregating them into something which seems to be arguing that a single solution is the best solution for each of the ones in this set. And I would be very interested in seeing the work go forward, but I would suggest that in scoping the work that you do it in a way that allows you to say, the best answer for this uh, member of that set may be different from the best answer for that member of the set. Uh, in particular, the, the set of problems you're dealing with, with something like identifying bad URLs, et cetera, um, doesn't really involve tying two actions together in the same way that an ad conversion does. So it may be that there are simpler um, mechanisms or only a partial use of this system that would still satisfy those, 
where invoking the full thing might be more difficult and not necessarily buying you everything uh, that it would need to buy you when, when you had the conversion case. So I think as a set of problems, it's interesting to work on, but I would prefer that we take it as a set uh, when we take the work in. Thank you, Ted. Uh, Philip? Yeah, I, I like this stuff. Uh, I don't think that we understand the problem, but I want to do it anyway. Um, I am a bit worried that we seem to have gone straight for the real highfalutin cryptography rather than measures like, let's just encrypt log files as they're produced rather than having them sit in plain text ready to be stolen. So there's a bunch of real bread and butter issues I think that we need to do as IETF before we do the stuff that really excites us. The other thing that I point to is this is being presented in terms of a network realization. I think that the more immediate and more useful use for this would be to assist work like the stuff that my wife does analyzing workers' compensation claims, in that there you've got an enormous amount of really privacy-sensitive data that is aggregated together, and then she analyzes it. And so it, that's not a network uh, application, but that transition from, I have this large amount of data, I would like to pre-process it into a form that it can't then leak in a dangerous way and analyze it in that form. I think that that technology would be very useful disconnected from the whole network case. And it might make for some uh, starting problems that are rather simpler than trying to think about how do we secure the web. Thank you. Um, Chris. So there we go. So uh, Chris, oh, I, Chris appears to have disappeared. He's showing us offline. Uh, let's move on to Wes. Uh, thanks. So, uh, you know, in general, I think this is a an interesting problem to look at, and it's certainly something that we could consider doing. It's uh, as Ted said, it it meets all of the BOF criteria, except for you know one oddity, right? That that this solution is really designed to help us protect ourselves or protect end users from good people, right? Because it, it has no ability to prevent all of the evil sites and the, the evil uh, you know, mechanisms and evil ad trackers that don't want to use aggregation because they're act deliberately trying to track individual people. And you know, I, I think it would be sort of fair to say that this cool new technology really helps you protect, protect you from companies that may already be behaving reasonably in the first place. And uh, that doesn't mean that it's not worth doing, but you know, there's a security consideration sections I'd be considering write, writing. Looks like Chris is connected again, so let's go ahead and take him next. Thanks. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I, I just wanted to echo something that Richard was saying in the chat um, uh, and, and perhaps uh, ask us to take a step back from the advertising use cases um, and recognize that uh, this, this pattern that we're seeing across the industry, across different problem domains uh, for collecting these aggregates, be it in uh, you know, telemetry for browsers or exposure notification for COVID or even you know, bandwidth measurements in the case of Tor is very, very common. Um, and I think it's certainly true that we have uh, confidence in um, the, the general shape of the problem, that is to say, we, we want to, we have, we, we need to collect these aggregate statistics to answer certain questions. Um, and it's, 
it, it, whether or not you know this is harmful or helpful for the purposes of uh, web advertisements and conversion measurements in a privacy preserving way, um, I think is a good question to ask. Um, but that does not, I don't think that takes away from uh, the, the very valid use cases that were also presented here um, uh, that uh, could certainly be improved uh, by a more privacy preserving protocol. So um, I, I am uh, very strongly supportive of this work. Um, it, it cuts across so many different problem domains and use cases, and um, it's uh, kind of inevitable um, that you know it be standardized somewhere, given how important it is. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so we've we've closed the queue in the interest of making certain we have enough time to discuss the proposed charter. Uh, although, uh, let's go ahead and move on to Ecker here. Yeah. So I would make a, a number of points. Um, so, so first, I think um, you know uh, Ted's point. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a toolbox um, that's got that, that has a variety of different tools, and I think that the, the you know that the one way to think about this is that the, the PPM protocol is the toolbox, and the BDAP is the tools. Um, and so, the idea is not is not to, is not to define any particular um, you know measurement measurement um, you know thing is to define is to define a set of mechanisms which can be used for taking different kinds of measurement and then you know individual applications they layer on top of those tools. Um, so that will be true both in terms of the you know which VDAS exist, and it will also be tr true in terms of like how um, how, how you build applications on top of on top of the VDAS. Because like you know, like I mean, the one thing about this is like you got a thing that basically has like, I can collect counts, right? And but like, what do you do with those counts is an important question, um, and one that we don't pr pretend to define. Um, the um, you know, it's uh, um, uh, I, I, I do see some over indexing on the ad, on the ad use case here as well. Um, you know. Uh, um, you know, there, there are a lot of use cases that are not ads, um, and in particular, like there's nothing ad specific to any of this. Um, all, all the ad specific work which exists will be over, over somewhere else in, in, in Pat CG. Um, so, I mean, this is about building a set of tools for measurements, um, and, and ads are really one application measurement. With that said, I, I do think that um, you know this question about like you know um, about, about this is for letting good people do th do good things. I think those, there's two points about that. One is that there are a lot of applications where. I, I, as Wes says, good people want to take measurements and want to be able to like bind themselves so they can't cheat you. I um, mean, so it can't be collecting the data they don't want to have. So that's application case one. I think application case two is um, that there's been a lot of like attempts to look at what it would take to like, you know, reproduce parts of the ad ecosystem with better privacy because like I think we all agree ads are not going to go away anytime soon. And one of the pushbacks that one gets when one starts, one starts doing that is it will have a negative impact on the, on the ecosystem as, as, a, as a whole. And like you know, I'm not um, you know um, I think you know Firefox has already deployed a bunch of anti-tracking technology, so like I'm not like all in on that. But I think it's a real concern people have. And so the idea is not that we only simply offer you know these alternative technologies and then people you can use them and third-party cookies. The idea is that the idea is that you offer the alternative and that, that will eventually tend to deprecate the existing um, privacy-based technologies. Thanks, Ecker. Um, Charlie. Yeah, I also wanted to uh, respond to Wes and some of the comments in the chat, just mostly to plus one what Ecker said. But yeah, um, uh, on the on the Google end, we're definitely looking at uh, like helping helping this this uh, tracking problem on the web with kind of a two pronged approach. Like one is having a well-lit path where we can recover use cases in a way that we know is is privacy preserving uh something like ppm could fit into this story and once we have kind of a uh a a foundation where some of the use cases that we think are are important to maintain the ecosystem are there then we can go ahead and uh remove kind of the bad stuff uh, that we think is bad for user privacy. So this question of like, oh, only the good guys will do it and the bad guys will use this other stuff. Like here, I think the platform can really mediate this. And if we think that the platform provides a good enough foundation, then we can we can remove the stuff that we think is is bad for user privacy. And this is like our our strategy that we're trying to do uh, on Chrome, where you know we're investing all this time trying to come up with new browser primitives. Um, and also we have like a timeline where we want to, uh, disable third party cookies, um, and deprecate them. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're, I, I, I think, I think this is like a reasonable point, but it's, you know, it's something that we're, we're, we're looking into as a, like a long-term strategy. Thank you very much, Charlie. 
Um, I do want to give Wendy an opportunity to to come back in if we think we've uh, solved the audio issues. Um, all right. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and move on to the charter then. I have it. Uh, <laughs> Up here in front of us, we've broken into two sections. Um, it's probably not terribly useful for me to try to read through it directly as it's on your screens. Um, but we want to go ahead and take some comments here. I see our area director has stepped up. Sorted out and told us to move on. I'm, I'm sorry, we missed the first part of what you said there, Roman. Ah, uh, Wendy said that she is not going to be able to get her audio working and told us to move on, but she appreciates the opportunity for the slot. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, this is the current proposed charter, or at least the first half of it. Um, I want to go ahead and open the floor to comments on the formulation that we have here. And recognizing that people are still reading, I'm going to give it a bit of time. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and skip on to the second half of the charter, which is where a lot of the meat is, um, specifically the second paragraph, talks about exactly what the working group will be doing. Florence. Hey, um, thank you. Um, so thanks for all the presentations, it's been really interesting. Um, so most presentations today were about use cases, um, but there's nothing about that in the charter, I don't think, although I can only see the second slide now, um, or I don't think currently in the draft. Um, I think that would be a useful thing to kind of document somewhere. Um, All right, thanks, Ecker. I think we're up for that. I guess um, you know. I think the, the, the one thing we're trying to do is with the use cases is motivational, um, because I think like the, these are generic techniques. But I think it'd be very, I think I'd be more than happy to think to like write down like what like enough motivational techniques to understand why you want to collect any given statistic. And just to say something, um, Siobhan should ask in the chat: Is there room for like for like multiple? Um, for like for like multiple instantiations of the same basic task, I think absolutely. So I think, for instance, if there's a if there's a better mechanism for, for for collecting heavy hitters than than hits, which is relatively expensive, that would like something be, like there's absolutely room for. Um, and I think you know, um, you know, uh, uh, like I'd certainly be interested. Like, like I, I think I want to build something where like as new cryptography gets developed, we can add it, and I want to build something where we can have multiple mechanisms that like support the same basic thing. Um, I think uh, you know the only the only question I I, I want to make sure is like you know if we have something that's like radically different in some like some like way that doesn't match up, then we have to ask would be better to make a new a new protocol or better to fit it in. But like I'm I'm like definitely pro fitting the, fitting new things in. <laughs> Thanks, Siobhan. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, that's that's encouraging. I just want to make sure that like the currently the charter I think would kind of rule out some of the ideas. Um, alternatives to achieve the same goals. So I think the charter would need some tweaking. So specifically, which aspect of it? Um, I think if you go to the previous one, okay. previous slide, sorry. Um, I think like split, splitting measurements between multiple non including servers, like I think um, that is like a class of for techniques for um, achieving this goal of privacy preserving measurements, but I think you could do it in other ways as well. 
Uh, and uh, I see there's some support to rewrite text. Uh, and I'm happy to send a PR. Uh, thank you for the clarification. OK, um, Jim. I think the charter needs to say something about use cases and threat models. I don't have any formal words for that at this point, but I do think that's the important thing to capture here because if we're going to be developing multiple solutions, as Ted was alluding to earlier, there might be different threat models that apply to them rather than a single overarching one. And I think it would be good to make sure that information is clearly captured when things are developed. And obviously that needs to fit into the charter. Cheers. Thank you. Now, uh, Eric. Somewhat on a similar line, actually, uh, there was uh, comments in the chat earlier about sort of differencing attacks and civil attacks and comments that differential privacy would be required and that the um, uh, the VDAFs have, um, you know, sort of had the scope for that. Is it meaningful to, like, say that these will support privacy, respecting incorporation values? Um, without having some definition of what we mean by uh, a, a, a private value, uh, or should that be here, or should that be at the at the VDAF level? All right, thanks, uh, Charlie. Yeah, I just wanted to. Uh... I guess drill in a little deeper in the charter of like what aggregation actually means. And it might be good to have maybe like a, a, a definition there. I see like with the server can't learn the value of individual measurements, which may, maybe that suffices to say, as long as that's the case, you can't, uh, you can't have aggregate measurements. But some of the use cases that we're considering, like, you know, are not, are, don't very neatly fall into this realm of like, you're learning an aggregate, like, you know, you're, if you learn like a private ML model that you can verify is, you know, differentially private or something like that, would we consider that an aggregate? Like maybe, maybe not, um, but it, it would be, it would be great if there's, you know, at least fr from our perspective, I think it would be great if things like uh, ML models fit within this scope of the charter. All right, thanks. Andrew. Uh, uh, yeah, just uh, uh, adding to the, the early point, uh, I completely agree with the idea of running in the use cases, but uh, just as an echo a point that's come up in the chat, um, um, I, th I think also consider uh, adding uh, abuse cases and ideally mitigations. Uh, as well, um, to, which might help alleviate some of the concerns about some of the dark practices in this uh, general area. Thanks. Thank you. Watson. Watson, I'm relaying a message from Wendy in the chat. Uh, she said, she wrote, I'm just going to voice support from W3C for this work, as there's work in incubation that could use it. Ah, thank you. Stephen. Yeah, just on the abuse cases, use cases thing, I think given that this, I think, is probably pretty good technology that could be used well, I'm not too worried about documenting use cases, and that could be a bit of a time sink. But given that this good technology could be abused, I think effort spent in that direction would be much more valuable, uh, if, particularly if we find ways of mitigating abuses that we see. OK, thanks. Nick. Uh, Nick Gardy, CBT. And thanks for presenting all of this, everyone. On the charter, I had uh, two questions or concerns for now. Um, one, I think we're talking about a, a, abuse and, and things like that. But I also think there's a lot of the privacy that depends on um, assumptions about uh, non-collusion or about how the uh, client is going to find the different servers or, or configure them. And I'm a little bit worried that that's all getting marked out of scope in, in the hope that like uh, maybe we can just ignore that problem or someone else will fix it. I, I'm, I, I guess I think we should be discussing it if, if we're going to put a lot of effort into 
um, into the work of the protocol that depends on those things. Um, the other concern is about the name. I think maybe it's come up a little bit already in the chat. Um, I, I think PRIB is, is both very confusing, does not describe the work that's happening about uh, privacy preserving measurement, um, and actively misleading that this is the group doing everything about privacy or incorporation of values sounds like a very general concept that I would support, but that this charter is not related to. So I think it's uh, actively misleading. We should change it. All right, thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, Nick, I'm going to ask that you send um, some concrete suggestions for your first bullet point to the list if you have some, some time to do so. Thanks. Sure. Uh, Chris. Just plus one to that, like I, I think it, it priv does seem overly broad. broad. Um, but also I wanted to address, okay, I want to talk about the abuse use cases people are talking about in chat. So uh, one of the things that was brought up is like, what about clients like trying to like corrupt the computation by sending bogus inputs or something like that. So that form of abuse is something that we're explicitly trying to rule out. So um, in the, in the, so like a VDAF is, is verifiable in the sense that um, invalid inputs can be detected and removed from the um, output of, of the computation. All right, thanks. So just for clarification, uh, and, and I, this is addressed at Stephen, um, when we're talking about abuse cases, is that the kind of abuse you're talking about? Or are you talking about like abuse of the actual data being collected? So <clears throat> again, pardon my ignorance, it's vast. But uh, so for example, if, if this tech, this this technology could be used to, to to measure things in too small in aggregates that are too small and that become exposing, or if if some application had some kind of opt in mechanism and then it was possible to change what gets measured in ways that are damaging for users. Those are, I think would be kind of abuses that are a bit you know a bit less concrete than than the example given. Um, you know. All right. Thanks. Yeah, it's. I was just. I was hearing what I thought were two senses of abuse, and that appears to be the case. So thanks right. for the clarification. But I, yeah, yeah. But I'm not. I'm explicitly not asking that we try and fix everything because it might not might not all be fix, fixable. But if we can think about it in detail and propose what mitigations are possible, then I think that that would be good. Thank you very much, uh, Yari. Thank you. Um, so plus one on the main confusion issue. Uh, plus one on talking about the abuse cases. And I, I think that's mostly by the, you know, whoever is doing the measurements, not, not so much about the abuse by, by the user. I think the user should still be able to produce the data that, that they want to produce as long as it's uh, sort of within bounds. Um, the other thing is that I, I think um, maybe there's some room for the discussion of opt-in, opt-out type of um, solutions. And if we learn from some other Protocol cases, like for instance in, in Quick, there's the spin bit where, where there's an arrangement that some fraction of users are automatically always excluded from from spinning um, in order to create this set of users that don't do a particular action. And similar techniques might actually apply here that you sort of automatically exclude some set of users, um, and, and then you sort of create this opportunity to uh, not do this, and users can opt out without being targeted as huh, opt outers. And so I, I think that that kind of thing would be important. Um, I don't have the specific language for the charter, but maybe something about um, you know enabling opt-in and opt-out or realistic opt-in and opt-out possibilities. Thank you. Thanks, Hacker. Generally, uh, just the opt-in thing. I mean, generally, these are these are configuration points of some kind, and, and, and clients, um, uh, um, you know. Uh, um, but I think you know the question of exactly how how, how users decide whether that got actually want to engage is like is like not, not generally thing we wear too much in ITF. Um, the um, uh, the po points you've been making are absolutely correct. Um, like um, you know, uh, th there's like a whole pile of material that has to be done about uh, ensuring that the that, that system, the box the system is in, does not allow for abuse by by, by the collector or by or by the various aggregators. Um, and that's like a that's like a big topic that. that um, that like absolutely have to make sure we have properly. Um, there's some work already in the document about it, but like it's it's, it's agreed and sufficient. So I think I would. Um, uh, I don't know if this is somebody's suggestion text, but I think absolutely having um, 
uh, um, uh, like some like I think having something in Texas that we had to work on, you know, um, actually like addressing those topics would be really important. That's and we should. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, Martin. Just to just to Yari's point, a lot of the systems that um, are, are being described here allow people to to opt out of the system without apparently opting out. They can generate the inputs to the system that appear to all intents and purposes as valid inputs to the system, but they're not actually contributing any any values to the system. And that's actually a useful property that is exploited in, in various ways. So um, I think that that capability exists. I'm not sure that we need to put those sorts of things into a charter. Um, I do think that we need to include some of the um, I think we need to include something generic about abuse. There is something in, very specific about abuse in here, about proofs of validity, but um, I, I've spent quite a lot of time thinking about things like civil attacks on various manifestations of these sorts of protocols, and, and those would be interesting things to, to have, at least uh, in the auspices of the group. Uh, so a slightly different thread that I meant to ask a while ago. Um, has there been any thought put on what type of ecosystem we really want to develop with this technology? Uh, let's consider the fact that collectors need to take data from uh, helpers and leaders, essentially. And are we expecting a small number of helpers and leaders that will be accepted by particular collectors? or? You know, can I and Stephen stand up our own helpers and leaders and expect everything to accept data that we submit to it? Because the two of us agree that we trust each other, but uh, but the collectors, you know, are the collectors only going to accept data from certain places? And so we end up with either a very small, very centralized ecosystem, or uh, or you know, a much more flexible framework. Thanks, Yuri. Yes, so just a quick response to Martin. So that's that's really good news. Um, and I, I wasn't looking for documenting any of that uh, detail in, in the charter, but perhaps the high level bit about there being effective opt-out mechanisms could, could be in the charter. Thank you. Thanks. Ecker? To answer is really worth this question, um, I think there's a bunch of like compatible models. Um, uh, I think that you know, the, the important thing to remember is that the person who um, going back to the threat model, I, had, I, I, I put up earlier, right? The, that um, the, the collector has to trust um, the, the help, the aggregators, but the clients also trust the aggregators because the, because the aggregators are responsible for storing the client's privacy. And so, as a practical matter, I would expect, I would anticipate that you know um, that that, there, that you know there'll be a, 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 a non like you know a non gigantic number of collector of, of different aggregators because fundamentally you're 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 trusting them to behave correctly right so what you just you know what's you, you and Stephen probably doesn't, doesn't work on except for like maybe you know maybe I'd be willing to submit it to that um, um, but um because people probably rely on, on relying on the rotations of collectors uh, oh, sorry the aggregators but I mean this is compatible with like an arbitrarily large number um I would expect to see really two models that we talked about um, one of which is um, you know, people who operate just as just as aggregators and are basically their job is to ensure the safety of the system. And then people who operate sort of like a more global system where it's like, you know, I like I don't know if you see amplitude, but it's like, you know, look, I am like data collection as a service and like, you know, I I I I I contract with several several different aggregators and that's how I provide the system in a box. So I bet to see those two models, but um there's nothing really centralized here. There's nothing there's like no there's no reason, you know, like every, you know, a, a, there's like there are plenty of like trustworthy entities in the world, and um and, and so there's nothing, nothing that basically requires like that like aggregator the collector A work with the same set of aggregators as collector B. Uh, Chris, to bump what Ecker just said, but also uh, also kind of point out that something that we've been working on in the protocol is lowering the bar of entry to running this, this system as much as we can. So there's this sort of asymmetry between leader and helper. So the leader is, uh, you know, and, and this could change um, uh, depending on what, pe what people's needs turn out to be. 
But what we have been thinking about so far is the helper should be very, very cheap to run and operate. Um, and a leader is inherently more expensive because it's getting uh, measurements directly from clients. It has to store them for some amount of time um, before uh, they can begin processing them. Um, how much you have to store and how long you have to store it depends on the VDAF you're running. Um, so, but I think this is one of our goals and I think this is an um, uh, important thing to keep in mind. Regardless of like how the ecosystem pans out, we want it to make we want to make the bar bar to entry as low as possible, I think. All right, thank you very much. Um, so at this point, we'd like to go ahead and move on to some questions uh, to inform the, the area directors and the IESG uh, about community interest for this. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and bring up polls for each of these, uh, but also uh, at certain points, we're going to ask that if you are not in support of forming the working group, that you go ahead and put yourself in the queue. So for the first question, uh, I'm going to ask who supports a working group with this charter. And this is modulo any changes that we've discussed today or come up in the mailing list um, shortly afterwards. And again, if you if you don't support uh, the charter and have not yet spoken, we urge you to join the microphone queue. Okay, we seem to have uh, slowed down. So thank you very much for the input on that. The next question we're going to ask is, uh, do we think, uh, um, do you have something to say, Alyssa? Well, I, maybe we should take them one at a time so we can hear from, uh, from the folks who did not raise their hand or explicitly left their hand down. Yes, I, I don't see anyone in the queue, though. OK, I just wanted to make sure it was clear to people that now is the time to, to do that if you have something to say about it. Yes, thanks. OK, we can move to the next one. Thanks. So for our second poll, um, do we think the problem statement is clear, well-scoped, solvable, and useful to solve? Um, uh, Ted, go ahead. Is, is this also a module of the discussion in the chat? Because there was a good bit of it that really did help. Uh, I would imagine yes. I have been following the chat myself. Um, but I would hope that any salient points for that would also be brought to the mailing list. Uh, sorry, I'm looking at the... Ted, I mean, the answer to that is yes. I mean, the work, the, the charter itself uh, is going to require some edits. We've had some good kind of feedback here. So consider the chat and the, and the presentations. So again, if you have you have concerns about the the scoping here, and have not yet spoken on them, uh, please add yourself to the microphone queue uh, so that we can understand better your position. Nick, go ahead, please. Um, 
Just, uh, okay, pr partly, yeah, okay, do, doing polls like this is, is tricky because we're uh, chatting about possible variations. I, I agree. But um, I, I think we have this like very open question about are use cases and abuse cases going to be put into the charter or are they going to be a work item? Um, and and until until some of that is settled, until we actually are going to define them, then I think that it's it's harder con to conclude that the problem statement is is uh, completely clear if we're not actually agreed on the use and abuses. Ah, thank you. Okay, Robin. Uh, and again, a personal statement, not on behalf of ISOC. Um, uh, I, I think the discussion in the chat about even the name of the group and most of the proposed names did not have the word value in values uh, raises questions about the, the, the scope and intent of the group that are fundamental enough that question two is very difficult to answer, as Nick said. Ah, okay, thank you. All right. So, uh, Ecker, go ahead. People seem to be like all worked up about the name. I just want to say, like, like what happened with the name is, like, we were calling this PPM, Privacy Reserve Measurement. People thought it was too close to IPPM. I like got punchy and like tried to figure out how to make it say PRIV. So, like, like really, like, there's like, like, like that's what's going on here. So, like, if you don't like that, like, suggest something else, <laughs> because like, like the the the. the like every every letter in there was like constructed to make it say PRIV, not for any actual reason other than that. Thank you. OK, and then the final two questions that we're going to have, um, typically we would have a raise of hands of this in a physical room um, because we do like to keep track of who exactly answered yes. But to do that effectively here, we're going to ask people in the chat, if you are willing to review documents associated with this working group, please respond with review. OK, so I, I've seen uh, on the order of 20 people respond so far. Uh, this is a very strong signal. Um, and secondly, uh, who here plans to be an editor for related documents? Please respond with edit in the chat. All right, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, that takes us to the end of the things that we wanted to discuss for this BOF. I think this has been very useful. And I want to give a few moments over to our area director uh, to speak. Hi, everyone. I'd like, hi, everyone. I'd like to repeat, uh, I think we've had a successful BOF, and I want to thank everyone for kind of all their input. I think the chat was just as lively uh, as, as the mic line, if not more. I mean, generally what I heard was there is a critical mass of interest in working in this kind of particular problem. There was repeated though tension I heard around this idea of, you know, are we okay working on ad tech and the ad use cases, you know, at the same time recognizing that it, that is the reality on the ground and that there would be wider applicability of this tech, much larger of these protocols, much larger than that particular kind of use case. I think in the charter discussion, we're not ready to go with this particular charter. There were a number of uh, really kind of helpful suggestions about how to polish that, and we'll double check and kind of confirm that. So specific things I heard reading off my list is things like, let's generalize the charter text to make sure we're sufficiently flexible so we can swap approaches so it's not just pre-owned the heavy hitters. We need to make sure that how we define aggregation doesn't restrict uh, you know, you know, other kind of alternatives. We talked about the need for work items to document the abuse cases and talk about the threat models against all of the portions of, of the architecture. And then we had quite a lot of conversations that we need to tune the working group name. I don't know what the solution is, uh, but that we, we would like a change there. Uh, and so I think the proponents uh, seemed open to, to making kind of those changes and that will, those changes will be made. And then we'll bring that back for confirmation. 
But otherwise, I, I think we do have a critical mass, and we should uh, we should kind of polish this uh, to con consensus, and so we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much for everyone attending this. This was a, a very well attended VOF. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks. For taking notes. Oh yes, thank you very much, Peter. And thank you to the chairs for bringing us all together and leading us through a good conversation. All right, thanks all. Peter, did you want to say something? Oh, just thanks. Okay.